If the therapeutic community movement had a pope, it would be George. Thank you. George. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Look, uh, it's obvious that uh, there's a lot to say, uh, and the time is a, is a restraining factor, and that's, that's a particular psychological challenge for me. But, uh, um, and you've heard some good things um, about the therapeutic community, and there's wonderful things going on in Ireland. But look, the, uh, my message in coming to Dublin this year uh, is in some ways a personal and professional message, but, if, uh, but it really, the context for it is to see the therapeutic community in terms of uh, a kind of a trajectory, an arc over some 50 years. We hear good things about it. We know that there's a lot of research that's established its effectiveness, or at least provides abundant evidence supporting the hypothesis of its effectiveness. And um, my concern at this point in that evolution, and what I really wanted to share with you, or at least use you to essentially purge myself of this, is to uh, point out uh, what therapeutic, therapeutic communities as a unique social psychological approach, what it has to do going forward. Because over the years, while it has become well established in the mainstream, paradoxically, there are too many examples of its uh, um, de decline in potency or at least uh, in its um, ability to get better and better as a unique approach. And the way I try to capture that idea is to try to remind both professionals and, and, uh, and the clients working in it that it's really a, 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 a method, a distinctive method that needs to be really understood and learned, trained and researched. So uh, in this brief talk, I, this talk has to do about those evolution, some of the evolutionary changes and uh, some of which have led really to uh, some real problems that therapeutic communities have to face going forward if they are going to get better at what they do and not disappear into simply uh, into some, uh, uh, the general pattern of treatments without any distinction or in fact vanish altogether. So um, in all of this, I'm, I'm moving through some of these slides, obviously, for time purposes, but uh, I want to I basically talk about three issues. Um, the main one, of course, uh, well, they're all main, but this particular point, plan duration of treatment, um, and the issues of funding which are associated with that, one of the main exogenous outside external factors that has affected therapeutic community functioning has been the policy, the uh, funding policies, basically to reduce planned duration of treatment. And, and this kind of a policy, certainly in North America, and I think there's plenty of evidence of it here in Europe, uh, is paradoxical in terms of the science. Everything we know about therapeutic community treatment, it turns out other treatments too, but, but certainly everything we know about therapeutic community treatments is that um, they, that approach deals with the most severe clients as Dr. Gorak pointed out, and, and we also know that to bring about the changes in therapeutic communities, um, it's a, you need a high kind of high intensity approach, which usually is correlated with time in treatment, so that we use time as a proxy really for the dosage of treatment, so to speak. The longer the client stays in treatment, the better they do. And uh, that's the science of that. Every, every major study and every review of the literature that includes therapeutic communities always points out this correlation between time and program and, and successful post-treatment outcomes. Uh, but paradoxically, in the face of that science, you have policy saying shorten treatment. And so uh, this is one of the kind of uh, remarkable barriers uh, in terms of um, a, a, a kind of, even from a medical point of view, uh, asking essentially the treatment to change itself in order to suit, uh, suit a fiscal policy. One effect of that, of the, 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 the funding issues, has been uh, essentially uh, to compel the treatment programs to move toward 
uh, shorter residential times from the original idealized of what we thought was an optimal time in treatment, 15 to, 20, 15 to 18 months. All the best studies, when we looked at the most impressive outcomes, always involved uh, residential stays of 12 to 18 months. And then in the prison studies, a continuation in the community uh, in, in terms of therapeutic community treatment. So it was lo long-term effects. But now we have uh, average plan durations of treatment in North America at about six to seven months in residential treatment, and with afterthoughts about aftercare. So uh, the, in terms of either three months, four months, seven months recommended aftercare treatments, it's quite absurd in terms of what we understand. Well, the problem with therapeutic communities as TC organizations, of course, they had to survive, so they've continued to adapt themselves to do this. But there are barriers which makes things essentially unadaptable in terms of can you produce 12 and 18 month outcome effects in six months? And, uh, and the issue is, of course, you don't. So a great challenge if the TCs are going to persist is they'll either have to make the case of defying this policy, in other words, come and see if we can mass continual evidence to show the impossibility of, of achieving these kind of outcomes with severe clients or and or begin to think about what you can do uh, in shorter plan durations of treatment. So rather than promise long-term remarkable recoveries for six, uh, nine months programs, we should begin talking about as one, as one strategy uh, is to uh, be begin thinking about what can be accomplished in six to nine months for the client to advance them to the next stage of recovery. So uh, what, these, what we're talking about here now is this slide, and again, forgive the movement through the slides, I'm just trying to get to the highlighted points given the restraint of time, is that one guideline on how to basically deal with this issue of adjusting the time and treatment for the client's severity is to follow what we now understand about matching in terms of client severity and it's the protocol or the profile of client severity. Uh, and essentially, if we do better assessment on the severity of the client, we can then talk about what is really the recommended dosage intensity of treatment for that client and uh, begin to talk about what a six month or nine month treatment approach can do versus what a 15 month or or, or, or 18 month. And this slide, as a matter of fact, I, 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 this is new information for you, so this is why I keep it in the talk. And it has to do with what we've learned now about matching. And we, the, the matching means the client, the, the client profile essentially assigned to the appropriate setting. And that's an intelligent approach in terms of uh, the, the, our whole addiction field and the, and the evolution of the treatment field. But what, we don't still have enough research on matching, but the, the, the bottom line that we now know is, is that it's clear that therapeutic communities do best with the most severe clients, and uh, that's been established in all studies. Uh, and then when we look at the issues of matching, however, we find that large numbers of severe clients don't go to the therapeutic communities. This is information about matching now. Large numbers of clients do not go to uh, the appropriate uh, modality. And when you follow their outcomes uh, in, let's say, outpatient treatment or shorter partial hospital treatment or shorter residential treatments, they don't do well. Uh, so they're undertreated. And uh, on the other side of that, there are significant numbers of people uh, who actually uh, will be of less severity. They have wound up in places like therapeutic communities. And these clients do well when they even essentially go to a treatment severity, a treatment intensity that is not quite matched for their severity. That is that one could say they, they, they might have done well with a, a, less, uh, a less intense treatment. These clients are overtreated, but those overtreated clients, essentially the main liability is probably cost or the fact that we, didn't, we could have done this uh, in a more efficient way. So essentially what you want is sufficient treatment. You want the, match, the ideal of matching, we know who this client is, we know what that severity is, and we know the intensity that they have to get. And when, we, in, when you look at therapeutic communities' outcomes, it's always the case that you see the best outcomes for these clients, the most severe clients, when they go into long-term residential treatment. And that's why in this slide I have, we have the main kind of uh, underscored bullet in the slide 
for severe clients, therapeutic community is the treatment of choice. So th with that premise, uh, you come back to the issue of now what I want funders to know, what I want the or TC organizations to know, is that that's what the science is telling us. So when you are modifying and going into six months and eight months and, and heroically you know, trying to do what you're trying to do in that period of time, you must really deal with the reality of what we've really learned now about this, and that is if we have to really shorten treatment, should we really be promising the same outcomes? You know what I mean? And it turns out, of course, we don't have a lot of recent studies now on outcomes with short-term treatment, any short-term treatment, but particularly short-term residential treatment. We don't have a sufficient research base on that since 2008 or 2009, or even earlier. So I'm still on the issue of what the, the, this challenge of funding and short-term treatment is. There's a second option on this, is you can refine the uh, the treatment matching options for different levels of severity, and that this is, has to do with uh, an ingenious approach of can we reconstitute the impact of long-term treatment by permutations of short-term and, and uh, shorter-term residents and longer-term outpatient. So you pull together, and essentially the idea is to keep the client in, a re, in an intensive recovery-based approach but does it all have to be in a residential setting? So this has been, there are a few studies and a few uh, heroic attempts by some programs to put together combinations of uh, short -term, shorter term residential treatment, but longer term outpatient treatment or non-residential treatment. Uh, and these still need to be well studied. The few, the few studies that we've done on that are encouraging. But the, the message of those studies is that that, that out, so-called outpatient component still has to be intensive and still has to use community as method, which I'll come to in a moment about as the, as the primary uh, treatment approach. So it's not simply a, a kind of menu or potpourri of evidence-based, evidence-informed strategies. It still needs the primary community as method, the unique power of the TC as its main approach to accomplish uh, these outcomes if we're going to use per permutations of shorter term residents and longer term non-residents as a way of dealing with the, the cost of long term treatment. So the, this, what this slide emphasizes now is this, uh, this what I think is more, a, a very creative solution to this. Remember I'm talking about not challenges so uh, we're, we're talking about solutions. What this emphasizes is that if TC organizations, are, while they still prepare themselves to deal with the, ch the continuing funding challenge and producing long-term recoveries, um, one way to deal with shorter-term approaches is to change the goals of shorter-term treatment. Now this one, uh, this is an intriguing uh, option. Uh, it's important to consider, I think, if you're working in a mature way in this field, and that is if, if we have to live with uh, shorter periods of time, change the goals for, those, for that period of time. And if you're going to change the goals for that period of time, that means essentially uh, develop uh, objectives uh, which are guided by what we, know, what we know about the recovery process, stages of recovery, and uh, based on what we know about how people recover, and we have some, some very good cl uh, clinical outlines on how that occurs, and use those as to decide how far can we move the client in the recovery process. Uh, and one of the key stages of recovery uh, that we now know, I think is very well established, is the motivational and readiness stage of change. I, I not only am referring to the very familiar stages of change, but uh, uh, that, that, that we know about in Prochansky and DiClemente, and, but I'm talking about what we now know about uh, long-term recovery, which needs to be better outlined than, let's say, a 10-stage recovery paradigm. But that critical stage is around what we'll call the motivation and readiness stage. I, when I particularly work in prisons and work with uh, TC programs now that are involved with basically six to nine month planned durations of treatment, short-term treatment, I always try to encourage them to reconsider what outcomes we can get in six to nine months. And one outcome you can refocus on is can we move clients to the stage of readiness, which means uh, the individual client gets to a point themselves 
where they now know that they have a long-term issue in their life that is essentially a life, can be a lifetime problem if they essentially move away from engaging in the change process or said in a converse way, they have to continue to involve themselves in the change process. So this is a message, for example, in the, in the prisons, I always remind that even in prison TCs, which are nine to 12 months in, in many cases, reminding those inmates that when they leave, if they don't continue in some change effort, uh, that the, uh, whatever they've learned and gotten here is very likely to dissipate and essentially not uh, serve them well over the long haul. So this is the issue of getting both programs and clients fully conscious and respectful about what can be achieved. And then when you finally articulate that clearly in terms of this issue of, as we know in recovery, the major contributor to recovery is the client's own motivation and readiness. And if they can get to that point where they're fully accepting the issues of their lives and making the personal commitment to continue in the change process, then they can use what resources are outside the program or even the so-called aftercare resources that the program may offer. And in that sense, we think we keep the individual in the recovery trajectory. So if we can't keep you here 16 months to essentially bring you further into that recovery process, we can uh, create a high impact to move you to a stage of recovery readiness where you can in fact now continue, with, continue this process on your own. I tell this to the residents not even sitting here. It continues even after 15 or 16 months. You have to continue in the process, working at yourself in the process of change. Okay, I think I've, I might have, uh, might have covered that one. Um, so I want to stop for the moment on that. Am I okay on time, uh, Rowdy? I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ad-libbing a lot tonight, so I want you to just, uh, you know, I need this for the show. Okay. I'm not going to talk much about the evidence because uh, it's a favorite topic of mine, but we've heard good reports about the evidence, but the, the headline around this is, uh, uh, despite the fact that we've got 40, 40 50 years of of, of evidence uh, supporting the effects of therapeutic communities. And of course, the traditional the issue we're talking about is the traditional uh, biomedical field, the, the traditional mental health uh, research establishment still has good reasons to challenge the evidence of TCs because we have a relatively absence or, or essentially a scarcity of uh, gold standard approaches. Professor Garan mentioned this in terms of uh, randomized controlled studies. And so these uh, are evidence TCs, you know, are, you know, rise up from the, you know, the marginals and the margins of society. So they're challenged by the mainstream society. Even the research has been challenged. As some of you know, my, my, my whole life has been involved in research on this. And even though I get pinches on the cheek and respectful winks and so on, I still, they, they, there's some challenge to uh, the evidence because it's not randomized controlled studies. So I've taken a lot of time to try to understand this issue. And, uh, and so, uh, it leads to a, going forward, what will be the challenge for the TC on this? We, well, we're fairly well established. I'm hoping, of course, is that one of the main outcomes, this relates to the first point that I'm making, that one of the main outcomes as we study the issue of evidence and the difficulties of randomized controlled trials, or indeed begin to question, essentially, the universality of gold standard thinking in general, uh, as we finally come around to maybe some other perspectives, is that we'll begin seeing that um, uh, over the long haul that um, we can begin uh, talking about uh, new, for, new ways of understanding uh, evidence and new ways of studying complex approaches. The one uh, example I use as challenging the entire gold standard paradigm is the, the case of the university. I might have, I said, it is mentioned in the article that you, that you cited, uh, which is we have 600 years of the university uh, in education, and we've con society absolutely concludes that university education is effective. And we, as, but as a matter of fact, folks, we don't have one randomized controlled study to demonstrate that. Uh, and it's, uh, you say, well, how did that come about? You know, and, and in fact, not only we don't have a randomized controlled study to demonstrate the effectiveness of the university or college, 
uh, we had, and no such study can ever be done in the university. Forget about therapeutic communities, they can't do it in the university because the university deliberately violates all the codes of a gold standard randomized control style. Uh, you can't go there unless you select yourself to go there, and then when you, when you finally get your application in there, they will reselect from that group. <laughs> so they're complete and totally biased who's coming in to this, to this university and then finally talk about the success of the university in terms of the graduation rates, you know what I mean? So the, uh, what I'm getting at, of course, and I don't want to eliminate the university, although I was in the university for years and still am at, and, and, and want you for it as a token anyway. But the, why I use that illustration, it's not only kind of humorous to think about, it's certainly absolutely true, of course, but, but it does tell you something. It says, and, and this is my comment about evidence and how TCs are going to have to rethink themselves, and I'm hoping some of the research professionals in the, in the audience will appreciate this, is that we have to begin thinking about understanding conclusions about why treatment works. And five minutes. Look, I'm willing, I'm willing even to stop on this show. It gets me excited, but, uh, but the conclusion about why treatment works. And this is one thing I have learned as a researcher, certainly in the, as a therapeutic community. I've concluded that treatment works in therapeutic communities. But watch this. Having said all that, I said, no, wait a minute. It's not that treatment works. It's not that treatment doesn't work. It's that the way we have to look at this whole phenomenon is the relationship between the individual and the activity. In this case, treatment activity. Clients come into therapeutic communities. <laughs> They come into a place, and we can describe in great detail what goes on in there. If you, as you go through the next two days of the conference, I hope this will come out. Therapeutic community, community is method. But if in this context of understanding how and why it works, treatment works, therapeutic communities work, because clients make them work. So the uh, education works, folks because the student makes it work. They put in the main contribution to however they change. So when, when we talk about clients coming into therapeutic communities and ultimately capture that in this uh, terse statement, if you participate, you will change. Uh, the word participate is that I have to do things, and if I have to do things, then I will change. So when I interpret treatment outcomes, it's always in terms of the client's motivation, they recognize they got a problem, their readiness, they're willing to take action for that problem, and then thirdly, they participate in the activities that essentially they use to change themselves, which turns out to be the definition of community as method, right? Communities teaching individuals to use the community to change themselves. So when I understand treatment outcomes, not only in TCs, certainly in the addiction field. No treatment works without the client making it work. And so that's, that's why we run into the limits of pharmacological approaches, which is so necessary in many, many cases as medically assisted approaches, because we know there's something beyond simply trying to alter the nervous system with the pharma pharmacological approach. Client has to be doing more than that in terms of sustaining some long-term recovery. So treatments work because clients make them work. So when we talk about uh, the issue of evidence for treatment, we need to rethink, given this proposition that I just shared with you, we have to rethink what, what evidence that we really need that, uh, that treatments are working. Well, one, of course, one obvious implication is when I walk into programs and I see clients very, very active in the, in the whole process. When I see them in, investing in time, time and effort, participating in groups, uh, running morning meetings, carrying out mutual verbal interactions with one another, which all focus on the change process, I have high hopes that we're going to see good outcomes. Even in many ways, even before I see the, the nature and the quality and the education and skill of the staff, so this is just an example of how we're going to have to be, begin rethinking in terms of uh, evidence. But, and one first proposition, this is my final repetition, which is rethink the, how we understand treatment outcomes, any treatment as a matter of, at least with the, uh, treatments that involve social psychological change in individuals. So um, 
I'm going to stop for the moment. I will almost stop. I want to add something to uh, the evidence story. Uh, most of the direct evidence, of course, has been doing these long-term outcome studies. Uh, but as some of you may have been hearing at the beginning of this conference on some of our workshops yesterday, uh, therapeutic community elements, which we don't have the time to discuss here in this meeting right here, but the, many of the key elements of the therapeutic community, while uniquely developed by the clients themselves over 50 years and uh, into a now very formal method, actually have a very uh, parallel corresponding examples outside of therapeutic communities. Now, in other words, very well-established social psychological learning principles uh, that have, have good empirical now support over the years in many other areas like peer tutoring and, and vicarious learning and trial and error learning uh, and, and, so, and reward learning and so on. All of that, those kinds of principles are embedded in therapeutic community activities. While the therapeutic community has found its own way to mediate those activities, how do you give reinforcements and how do you essentially give affirmations and correctives to people, all of that has a, a good sound parallel in good social psychology, even though it was never, TCs were not developed by social psychology, they were developed uniquely. Now why I keep emphasizing this is because this makes the point of what I would call indirect evidence. Therapeutic communities have a heavy weight of indirect evidence supporting what it does. When we say, is it an evidence-informed treatment? It's, it's profoundly evidence-informed. If you looked at all of its major activities, you can say they, these have their counterparts in, in many other treatment approaches and in many other uh, schools of, of social psychological learning and principles of learning. So there's not only the source of evidence from what I call direct studies, which are outcome studies of the therapeutic community, but a mountain and of literature and social psychology which establishes the principles that are probably underlying what's happening in therapeutic communities. So there's a story to tell, but what I'm hoping that the, that the TCs going forward uh, will brace themselves for around some of these issues about how we should really be delivering treatment in terms of what we know about recovery and, and the scientists who study this, how we should be studying the therapeutic communities uh, knowing now some of the complexities of the approach and the meaning of, of evidence. All right, let me, let me stop and, and say good morning to everybody again. I, I regret the fact that I didn't, uh, we didn't have more time, but maybe it's a good thing I have to learn how to do this this way. You know? <laughs>